Palisade Radio is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Welcome, everyone, to another show of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Very, very excited to have a new guest on the program. His name is Atai Friedman. He's the CEO of Ayal Capital Management LP, manages millions and millions of dollars. And uh, Atai is what maybe you could characterize as a super, super bear. And uh, we're going to have a discussion with him today on a few different topics. Uh, we're going to start out here talking about how ATI sees uh, the U.S. stock market developing over the coming months. ATI, welcome to the program. Hi, how you doing? Thank you for having me. Yeah, doing great. Thanks for asking. Uh, we had a great discussion a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was happy to get connected with you. Uh, you were you were talking about some of the other guests that we've had on the program. Uh, you know, of course, Doom and Gloom, Mark Faber, uh, Peter Schiff, and you said these guys don't even come close to what I see happening with uh, with the economy and the bear market. We're going to enter, and you provided some very compelling proof uh, as to why you see things uh, unraveling in the way that you do. Give us um, a high a high level overview of uh, where you see the economy at right now. Okay, well, um, I will say this uh, just to make it perfectly clear: I am not uh, one of those uh, perma bears who's been bearish for uh, a number of years. I did not, in fact, become bearish until. Uh, July of 2015, and that was prompted by a widening of of credit spreads uh, across the spectrum. That uh, always catches my attention. They had been uh, pretty tight uh, since 2013, and uh, they started widening significantly over the summer of 2015, and that, that raised a red flag and got me digging <clears throat> uh, into the causes as to uh, what was behind the, the widening of spreads. And uh, uh, what had happened was uh, I really dug deep into, uh, into the debt markets and uh, <clears throat> came to the conclusion, I guess I'm, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but I came to the conclusion that uh, we are, uh, at, in, in fact, at the end of a, I guess, you know, they, they refer to the commodities cycle as a super cycle. We're at the end of a, of a debt super cycle uh, in the world, not just in the United States. <clears throat> and that means that there is... Uh, that the world is not able to service any more debt uh, at this time. And uh, the amount of debt outstanding is roughly, in the world, is roughly around $225 trillion. Um, and if you go back uh, through history, um, the last uh, crisis we had in 07, 08, 09, uh, world debt was at around 140 trillion. Now that crisis was caused by uh, uh, too much mortgage debt and too much debt in general. And uh, what you find if you dig it historically into what the Federal Reserve has been doing over the last 25 years, you find that the Federal Reserve has propagated this uh, debt bubble, um, and they've used debt to uh, get the U.S. economy out of uh, uh, trouble, so to speak, uh, or, or more specifically, not even the, the economy, but the uh, financial markets. Whenever we've had very uh, severe turbulence in the financial markets, the Federal Reserve, starting in 1987, uh, which which they had not been doing before then, uh, stepped in and started offering uh, liquidity and uh, um, stimulus into for the banking system to keep the financial markets steady and to prevent systemic financial uh, uh, crisis uh, from overwhelming the financial markets. And so it started in '87. 
that was really the, the, the year that the Fed put was brought into being. Um, then in 1998, with long-term capital, once again, the Fed intervened. Um, then in 2000, 2001, the Fed intervened again when the tech bubble uh, collapsed. Uh, this time they used interest rates to uh, soften the blow of the recession and the stock market collapse. And that was really when the debt creation kicked into overdrive uh, because from uh, 2001, 2002 to 2007, I believe $18 trillion in debt was created in the U.S. economy. So the whole expansion after the tech bubble uh, was really a debt-fueled uh, binge that uh, came to an end in 2007. And once again, uh, the economy faced uh, an existential crisis, actually this time, um, and instead of the Fed letting uh, a lot more of the indebted entities collapse and disappear and the lesson uh, of being over levered, uh, being learned by market participants, everyone except Lehman was bailed out. So the amount of moral hazard that was introduced in the marketplace in 2008, 2009 was really uh, quite tremendous. And you can see so you can see a lot of it manifested uh, today. For instance, um, subprime mortgages no longer are all the rage, but subprime auto loans have become all the rage. And the similarities between the two are extremely striking, um, meaning that uh, subprime auto loans are really driving auto sales at the moment. And uh, these loans are being packaged up and sold as asset-backed securities. And you have some of these loans, and of course they're all being rated AAA, but some of these, these uh, ABS uh, securities um, <laughs> have, uh, let's say, 20% of the loans within an, a given issue uh, do not even have credit scores. So, I mean, if you want to get a car loan right now, li literally you do not need a credit score. You don't need any credit. You just need to show up, have a heartbeat, and you can get a car. Uh, in, maybe it ha it'll have to be a used car, but you will walk off the lot with a car in hand. It'll be a seven-year note. You'll have negative equity as soon as you leave. You'll have, an, uh, you'll have a high interest rate but it will not require a, a dime in the bank or any credit whatsoever. So, you know, history is repeating itself uh, quite simply because of the moral hazard that the Fed has introduced. So long story short, <clears throat> we've reached a point where we cannot, the world cannot service any more debt. And I say that because interest rates in Europe and Japan are, uh, have gone negative in the U.S., they're you know close to zero. I expect them to go negative within the next 12 to 24 months. <clears throat> and negative interest rates send a very powerful message, which is uh, no one has the ability or the inclination to take on more leverage. Um, you know, just when, just like when very high interest rates indicate high inflation. Uh, very low to negative interest rates indicate deflation, indic indicate uh, the slowing of velocity of money, um, indicate that people do not want leverage. And so uh, when we go into our next recession, which I believe we're, going, we're headed into as we speak, the tools that the Fed has uh, grown accustomed to using, which is uh, inducing pe the, the public and businesses to cr to uh, uh, create debt or to um, take on more debt, uh, are, is not going to happen this time around. 
So we're actually going to have a full-blown deleveraging like we had in the 20s and 30s. And, uh, you know, from a, uh, 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 I guess, a from, from the perspective of the severity of the situation, uh, deleveraging uh, of a debt bubble is pretty much the most uh, horrific thing you can experience in the economy because it leads to outright deflation, uh, it, it leads to wealth destruction, it leads to lower incomes, it leads to much higher unemployment, and the Federal Reserve is powerless to stop it. So that's kind of the, the sum, uh, summary of, uh, of my thesis and where I'm coming from and how I'm looking at the markets. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to actually read off of uh, an online profile I found of you, which outlines, uh, I guess, a, a very uh, uh, short version of your thesis. And it reads, global markets and economies are at the end of a super cycle in debt that had global debt at $200 trillion in 2014, $60 trillion higher than in 2007. This debt bubble is created by central banks, namely the Federal Reserve in response to every financial crisis since 1998. The Fed fulfilling its mandate for full employment lowered interest rates during every financial crisis since LTCM failed. By lowering rates, the Fed encouraged people and businesses to take on debt to stimulate the economy. This came to a head in 07, but once again, the Fed intervened by dropping rates to zero and by purchasing debt securities in the open market to push down long-term interest rates. And this is a, a great summary you've put together here. And at the end, it says, at the moment, the U.S. high yield debt, a $1.2 trillion market, is imploding. My question for you is, we're in, in, we are in uncharted territory. Uh, this hasn't really happened before, uh, but you're comparing it to uh, kind of the deflationary crash that we had in the Great, Great Depression back in the 30s. And uh, on our call a couple weeks ago, you pointed to some indicators such as Tobin's cue of why today is so bad and why we have hit, uh, <clears throat> call it the top why the crash is imminent. So why do you think that the crash is imminent right now? I think it's imminent because, um, first of all, uh, I do not accept the consensus belief that China is uh, growing uh, at uh, 4%, 5%, or 6%. It doesn't matter. It, they, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that there is any growth in their economy whatsoever. And I would point to, uh, uh, first, uh, first and foremost, the commodities markets, seeing as China is the biggest consumer of commodities in the world. The fact that commodity prices are at 25-year lows is a major red flag. Another red flag is uh, commodity shipping prices are actually uh, at half the level they were the month after Lehman collapsed in 2008. And that is pretty startling and uh, astounding because it does not feel like the month after Lehman in the rest of the world, but in the commodity shipping market, basically the commodity shipping market is dead right now. There's oversupply. There are boat. There are huge ships, uh, cape size size ships that are uh, sitting idling in port in Singapore and around the world that have no cargo whatsoever to carry. And when they do have orders and cargo to carry, the prices they're charging are rock bottom. They're record lows, 30, 31 year lows, and. It's just, in my mind, it's impossible to conclude that China is growing and at the same time, there are no commodities being shipped to and from uh, China at the moment. It, it just it doesn't make sense. You know, they, despite the fact that they are making a transition from an industrial economy to a more service oriented economy. They are a very heavily industrial economy. And by all, by all measures and anecdotal evidence, 
their industrial uh, part, the industrial part of their economy is at a standstill. Um, there was actually a purchasing managers index that was being done privately in China uh, called the Mingxin PMI, and the last reading of the Mingxin PMI was uh, in the 42 to 43 range, uh, with of course anything under 50 indicating contraction. Now, 42, 43 would correspond to the U.S. economy in the second and third quarter of 2008. And the best part about this survey is that the Chinese government, about six weeks ago, came out and suspended it. They literally uh, stopped it from being published. And so now the only thing that's coming out of China is official government official government data, which everyone knows is complete nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. Their government data is, is simply what they want the world and their public to think their economy is doing. It is is no part based uh, or or uh, yeah based on uh, reality. So I don't even know why. Uh, uh, you know, services like Bloomberg report China's economic data because it's 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 nonsense. I mean, you know, the Minx and PMI is at 42, but the Chinese government, their the the official Chinese government data says their PMI is at 50.2 or 50.3. I mean, you know, <laughs> they're never going to admit that they're in recession ever. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's a very good point that you bring up. And uh, you were quite modest in your previous discussion of the sub subprime auto loan uh, catastrophe that you see happening. Uh, you're actually quite possibly the very only person in the world to have done a trade against the subprime auto loans. Uh, and it is a very recent trade. Uh, it's a pretty funny story in that uh, you're not really allowed to talk too much about it. Uh, but what can you tell us about the trade that you ran there? Uh, yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, subprime after uh, 2008, 2009 became a uh, four-letter word at most uh, banking institutions in the U.S. Um, there was a lot of negative publicity uh, attached to uh, those people who bet against subprime housing using customized uh, CVS um, as uh, uh, as exemplified by um, oh dear, I forgot his name uh, the guy who wrote The Big Short in the movie of course uh, that came out The Big Short Michael and Lewis yep Mike that's right Michael Lewis who you know he's talked at length about these uh, um, CVS that were constructed on custom subprime indices um, by savvy clients who recognized what was going on. So this time around, the action is not in subprime mortgages because uh, there basically are not uh, any subprime mortgages being originated. I mean, there are, but we're talking in the billions, not the hundreds of billions like they were in 06 and 07. Um, now what's going on is the subprime uh, activity is all focused on the auto sector and it's actually driving auto sales and I started reading about uh, what was going into these loans uh, um, and I also started following the delinquency rates of subprime auto loans and delinquency rates are exploding. Um, the credit quality of the borrowers is, it's a joke. I mean, it's, it's really, it's like, it's a, a copycat of, of, of the subprime mortgage situation in 2007, meaning you have people who should not be getting loans, who are getting loans that are, and, and these people are most assuredly going to default on these loans very soon, but these loans are being bundled up into ABS, 
and sold off with AAA uh, ratings to, you know, and it's hard for me to say unsuspecting investors, but I guess that's what you have to call it. So the uh, opportunity was too uh, uh, good to pass up. The problem was finding a bank to do a trade with. Um, there are some banks, I'm not going to mention any names, that if you call them and you mention subprime, just the word subprime, they will literally hang up the phone on you. Um, the bank that I ended up doing my trade with was somebody who I had a long working uh, professional working relationship with uh, over 10 years of trading um, going back to when I was at SAC Capital. We did a lot of business together and uh, they actually did me a favor uh, by uh, helping me construct the trade that I put on in the fall and then I took off in January uh, because I was worried about liquidity um, and the trade, uh, uh, you know, I can't say it was a home run because I didn't hold it uh, as long as I wanted to, but I made quite a bit of money on the trade um, and I was grateful that uh, I was able to actually put the trade on, but this is a sector of debt that is, I mean, it's going to get absolutely uh, decimated. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be getting decimated, but the, the stuff that they're putting in these loans are, or I should say into these ABS are, uh, it's a joke. I mean, 20% of the loans have no credit scores. 20% of the loans have credit scores below 600. I mean, it's <laughs> it's about as toxic as it gets. How how large is the uh, auto loan business? Is it anything that compares in size to the the housing bubble, which of course crashed an entire economy? No, because uh, subprime uh, mortgage was like 1.2 trillion, I believe, and subprime auto is in the is in the hundreds of billions. Uh, it's definitely much smaller, uh, obviously, because the, each the individual loans are much smaller than the individual subprime mortgage loans. But uh, it's enough that it's going to cause uh, some waves. But uh, I don't know that you're going to uh, see a, a breakdown in finance come from this corner of the credit market. I think more broadly you're going to see it come from the junk bond market uh, because uh, there was a lot of debt that was underwritten over the last couple of years that should not have been underwritten. And the parallels between subprime mortgages and junk bonds are actually quite strong. And uh, the performance of high-yield debt over the last couple of months has, uh, uh, has proven that. Yeah, and I, I wanted to ask, you kind of already just answered this, but have you identified a individual basket uh, of debt that is likely to crash the economy? You just said junk bonds, but I'm thinking uh, student loan, uh, junk bonds specifically tied to the oil sector. Uh, is there any individual thing that you've honed in on, or is it an unknown because so many things are over levered? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've been kind of... Uh, I've been trying to, you know, it's really, it's, it's almost an arrogant exercise to try to uh, figure out what is going to uh, be the inflection point in the market. What is really going to cause people to uh, reassess uh, the values of uh, financial assets in a dramatic fashion? Um, and I think it's either going to come through uh, ma a major bankruptcy uh, or bankruptcies in the, let's say, the energy sector, or it's going to be it's going to come from the, the Chinese recession manifesting itself somehow. So in, in how, 
right now the consensus believes China is growing. So it has not manifested itself in any way that, well, I shouldn't say that because, you, you know, if you look at the dry bulb shipping industry, which is on the verge of, you know, in going bankrupt in its entirety, um, you, you can certainly argue that there are places that the, the Chinese economy's problems are manifesting itself, but not... Uh, not enough, not enough to, you know, to the extent that people are marking down financial assets around the globe. They started to in January, then we had a bit of a relief rally, we bounced, I think we're about to start our next leg down, but, um, you know, the catalyst for uh, a big unwind, it's really, a, it's a tough call, I mean, you know, I find it hard to believe that it's going to come out of the financial sector because that's where the last crisis uh, started and history uh, seldom repeats itself uh, with such, uh, um, you know, exactitude, you know, another crisis coming from the financial sector, but at the same time, Banks in Europe and banks exposed to China are seeing their credit default swaps trade at uh, at financial crisis levels. I mean, you know, you have a bank like Deutsche Bank that has a two trillion balance sheet and 66 billion in tangible equity. They don't have a lot of room for error at Deutsche Bank, uh, which is very reminiscent to Lehman Brothers. And Deutsche Bank CES is trading higher than it was in the 08-09 financial crisis, which is extremely striking. So I say on the one hand, I don't see problems emanating from the financial sector or that being the uh, uh, starting point of, of the collapse. But, you know, when you look at a bank like Deutsche Bank, and their precarious financial situation, you, you, it's hard to ignore. I mean, uh, just a, a slight shift in the value of their assets, of, of their balance sheet and their equity is going to be wiped out. And that's going to be the end of the budget bank. Okay, well, this is, uh, this is such an enlightening conversation. Uh, and unfortunately, time is a restriction. But there's one topic that I would like to discuss today uh, because uh, the sector has started to move uh, in earnest over the last few weeks. And uh, we can have broader discussions on our next chat. But the, uh, the gold space and the gold mining space, we talked about this a, a bit before we hit record, uh, just how difficult it is for uh traders who are watching the mining space it really is convincing that a bottom's in and uh you know that this is the safe haven bid of of the environment that we're in is is gold uh but you know if that's not the case we've just had this huge move and a lot of these companies are up 50 and 100 percent already um you know it's i hate to jump in at the wrong time right so what's your feeling on on gold and gold mining stocks well i uh <clears throat> i uh I, I, about two to three months ago, uh, when the, I'll just use the XAU, the Philly Gold and Silver Index, was trading at a level that corresponded to $300 an ounce gold. I, uh, gold stocks had caught my interest, and I did some uh, short term trading uh, of the stocks. I was really just trading in and out of them every couple days, um, uh, uh, not uh, playing for any big move. I thought that uh, as this uh, crisis unfolds, this massive crisis uh, that's going to dwarf 08, 09, um, I thought gold is going to have a role to play. The question is, is it going to be a safe haven or is its role going to be uh, something that comes later down the line when the central banks uh, <clears throat> figure out a way to actually create uh, real uh, 
high rates of inflation, which I think they would opt for over uh, a really uh, 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 terrible deflation. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me that they can orchestrate that process, but you know, you have guys like Ray Dalio talking about helicopter money uh, right now before much of anything has happened, and uh, gold stocks uh, in the last month have had this tremendous move. Gold has had a tremendous move. It's acting like a safe haven. So now I'm starting to, uh, I, well, I watch it closely every day. I just did not know if it was going to participate in the early rounds of this uh, unwind or, or not. And so the answer appears to be yes. Now uh, I'm forced with chasing uh, what has been a pretty big rally in the last six weeks. Although, if you pull up a five-year chart of gold mining stocks, the, the rally over the last two months looks like a blip compared to where they were. So if you put it into some perspective, the move is not that big. They just aren't the screaming bargain that they were uh, uh, two months ago. Um, and when, you know, I literally... Uh, overlay the XAU over gold prices and the level of, of the XAU uh, two months ago was exactly where gold or where it was where gold was when gold was $300 an ounce in the late 90s. So the mining stocks were trading extremely cheap to the commodity. Uh, that is no longer the case, but um, now it's just a question of do you uh, <clears throat> wait for a pullback, do you chase, do you, do you jump on board, do you chase the rally a bit? It's, uh, it's really, it's an, for me personally, it's an extremely tough call, and I don't have anything on in this sector, and of course I'm uh, a little upset by the fact that I missed out on this uh, beautiful rally that we've had, but I, I will tell you this, I am looking for a pullback uh, to uh, enter uh, the space, but uh, I just have this bad feeling that there may not be any pullbacks, that this move just may go on uh, without any material breaks. So uh, gold, you know, high on my radar screen, uh, but I'm not really doing anything about it. I mean, I don't have the, conv the conviction level uh, uh, for gold that I have, let's say, for uh, U.S. Treasury bonds, uh, for instance, which I think are going to be uh, and have already begun to be a home run. They're going to, I think we're going to have negative interest rates in the U.S. within the next year or two, and Treasury bonds, uh, if you believe that, uh, Treasury bonds uh, uh, certainly have a ways to go uh, in terms of uh, price. So, but uh, anyway, in reference to gold, I think uh, I would get involved. I would just wait for uh, a very uh, serious pullback before getting involved. Um, so in case this is a head fake move and this really isn't a safe haven uh, after all, you don't get burned buying uh, gold mining stocks up uh, 50, 60, 70, 80%. That's about it. That's just, a, a, you know, it's a missed opportunity for me. Well, summing up, the great unwind has begun. China uh, not growing at all, in your opinion, and another great depression uh, likely ahead with equity prices to come down 60, 70, even 80 uh, percent. And you are the guy who's put on uh, a successful short of the sub subprime auto uh, loans, which nobody is really even talking about. So congratulations there. Itai, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you have a busy schedule and uh, lots of money that you're sitting there uh, managing uh, for, for people. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule and maybe we can get you back on the show to 
uh, discuss some more actionable uh, trades that you're looking at doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you having me. It was, a, it was really my pleasure talking about it. I love uh, talking about it, and uh, I almost feel like it's my duty to, uh, to uh, warn people uh, as to what is lurking around the corner. I, I really I do not want to see uh, large groups of people getting hurt by what I think is coming. And uh, I would say my conviction level is uh, about as high as it gets. Yeah, and have you seen the uh, Big Short Atai? I, I read the book, I saw the movie, and uh, I actually, uh, in 07, when I was at SAC, um, in June of 07, I convinced uh, Steve Cohen to buy uh, about $80 million worth of VIX futures when the VIX was trading 15. Um, uh, this was when uh, uh, investment grade credit spreads went from 25 basis points to 100 basis points in about four weeks. And uh, I saw an, a, a, like once in a lifetime opportunity to buy equity volatility. And uh, we did, and uh, you know, we killed it with the trade. Um, so uh, I remember it, I lived it, I traded it. Um, um, I will say, I think the book is a hell of a lot better than the movie, but that's just my opinion. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Itai, thank you again for coming on the show and uh, looking forward to having you back soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Your mining sector, and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? 